Thank you, Paul, and good morning, everyone. Um, believe me, uh, this, what I'm going to say is the simplest thing you're going to hear today. Um, and my apologies for those of you who've heard me before on the same subject. Um, I'm sorry you're going to have to put up with listening to it again. But perhaps it's useful to remind us of why we're all here and to provide, for those of you who haven't heard me before, um, it provides a broader perspective on, on, on why we're here and why we have an administrative data, administrative data seminars. Um, I think it's really important also to point out that this is the seventh administrative data seminar that the CSO have, have um, organized. And what, what it was very striking to me in thinking about this seminar and preparing for today is, is the amount of progress we've made. So the theme of what I'm going to talk about is really where we started from and the progress we've made and hopefully to where we're going to. So the first thing is just the National Statistic Board. I'm not going to go through this in detail, but just so you know who we are, we are the board who really oversees the work of the CSO. And if needs be, we have a, we have a, a role in terms of arbitration, but fortunately we've never had to take up that role to any significant extent. So basically the board operates as a, a kind of honest broker uh, between, the, between the government system and the CSO in terms of uh, emphasizing the importance of, uh, uh, of a strategy for official statistics. And in that context, we have for a very long time um, promoted the whole idea of the Irish statistical system. So we started really in 2003, moving away from focusing purely on the CSO to focusing on the wider, broader Irish statistical system, which was a relatively new and very revolutionary idea at the time, because non-statistical bodies didn't think of themselves at that time as part of a system. And that, of course, brought us to the notion of administrative data and the data holdings that, that uh, bodies other than the CSO have and their potential value for the compilation of official statistics. And it became, we became very, very, um, very conscious of the fact that we could really reduce the burden on respondents by using administrative data uh, uh, more efficiently. And, and believe me, that was reasonably revolutionary back in 2003. But clearly, once you start focusing on administrative data, you run smack up against the limitations of being able to do that because of the lack of unique identifiers to link and to match data. So that's where the whole idea of a national data infrastructure was born. So the national data infrastructure essentially is about, and this is a term we, we, we use a great deal in the board and in, in our strategies, and essentially it's about three things really. One, it's about um, unique identifiers, and I'll come to talk about those in a little bit more detail. Secondly, it's about the use of common standards, because those of you who are in the system will know very well, or those of you who are in the CSO, that we don't really have, as yet, a set of common standards across the system, so that one organisation may be looking at, um, at, at one set of age ranges, age cohorts, and another may be looking at defining them in a different way, for example. Um, so that's the, the idea of the national data infrastructure. And you've, m many of you in this room will have seen this diagram before, but I, I, I like to look at it to remind myself of what is it we're talking about here. We're talking about linking places, people, and businesses, and linking all of the places that those, where those data about people, people, places, and businesses exist. But the only way we can do that is by using three sets of unique identifiers, the personal, the PPSN for the personal, the unique business identifier for businesses, and the, um, uh, the air codes for, for place. So that was our background in the board. And in, in 2015, we decided to take a fairly bold step and say, you know, the time has come to really nail our colors to the mast here and say, how can we have a world-class statistical system for Ireland? Because we were looking to the Netherlands, which you'll hear lots about later on, and, and you'll be astonished when you see how long it is that they've been using administrative data. We looked to the Scandinavian countries, of course, as, as, as exemplars, and we even invited over the uh, head of, the, of the Statistics Denmark to launch our strategy. But what we said was, in order to have a world-class statistical, official statistical system for Ireland, what do we need to do? Well, clearly we need to use data from administrative sources. We'd always known that. But also nowadays we need to look at other uh, data sources, so-called big data. But, but predominantly what we need to do is create registers, and those registers will be based on administrative data. And you'll hear a lot more about that later today. And, and, and so this is by way of providing context for that. Um, and obviously that needs UBI, or it needs a national data infrastructure, it needs unique identifiers. So the question then was, how can this happen? How can we make it happen? 
And we can only make it happen if certain places, if certain leadership happens within the system. And the leadership needed to happen through engagement of the public sector. In other words, the state needed to buy into this. The system needed to buy into this and say, this is important for Ireland, we need to do it. But also the state needed to believe in the state apparatus that this would actually work for the state by providing much better data for policy, administration and service. And in the end of the day, all of our favourite um, uh, concepts nowadays like transparency and better, better uh, and efficiency and better services to citizens would be served by having a much more efficient um, national data infrastructure and a much more efficient, much more efficient um, a statistical system. So what did we need to have to realise the vision? As I said, we needed leadership from, the, um, from essentially two sources, the, the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform, which is the uh, spending department, but also the administrative department, who has responsibility, which has responsibility for these areas, from the office of the chief information officer, the government chief information officer, which is a relatively recently um, established um, body. And at the time that we actually did our strategy, there wasn't a person in, in place, but there since has been a, a very active um, chief government information officer. We argued that the CSO needed to have a very significant coordination role here. We argued that there needed to be, within the public service, within the Irish government service, a statistical service comparable to the um, Irish government economic service, which had already existed and which was created, as you will recall, in the wake of the recession and the recognition that there really wasn't enough knowledge about economic issues within government departments. Equally, we felt, as a board, that there, we wouldn't really progress with this unless we had more uh, statisticians embedded in government departments, but that those statisticians statisticians had an identity and, a, and a, a relationship with the CSO and a solidarity among themselves which, which enabled them to, to maintain their statistical lens as well as their policy lens as being embedded in the department. We also recognised that we needed uh, ICT and data strategies for the public sector and that all of this needed to be underpinned by legislation. And uh, all of these points are detailed in our strategy copies of which are at the bottom of the room for anybody who hasn't read them cover to cover already. Um, so, the, uh, so in terms of progress to date then, um, I'm happy to say that we've made quite a lot of progress since 2015. And I've just put on this slide the headlines of the, of the areas in which we have made progress. So in terms of leadership, we've had hugely important leadership from the Civil Service Management Board. And the Civil Service Management Board are essentially overseeing this, the process of civil service renewal, which is going on in the Irish Public Service. And by adopting, if you like, through um, Article uh, Action 24 of the Civil Service new, Renewal Plan, which is really about improving how data is, is collected, managed, and shared, and by having key sponsors for this action, significant progress has been made. The first thing that's happened is the notion of NDI, the National Data Infrastructure, which we as a board tended to, to equate primarily with the notion of unique identifiers and common standards, has been extended to encompass more of the hardware as well as the software of the system. And, and that's been very, very um, useful and helpful. Secondly, a cross-departmental departmental champions group has been established under the auspices of, of the Action 24 of the, the Civil Service Renewal Plan. And those people have been meeting regularly and have been monitoring adoption of the unique identifiers. And I'm happy to say that progress is reasonably good on the PPSN. Progress is also pretty good on the UPI. And of course, the big bogey is the air codes. And I'll come back to the air codes uh, before I finish. Um, and also, I'm happy to say that great progress has been made in relation to legislation. We now have the um, data sharing and governance legislation in, in the Dáil, has gone through the Senate, currently in the Dáil, at stage three in the Dáil, a few more stages to go, but we would be hopeful that that will be through shortly. And that is really important because this, um, this legislation will provide for the regulation of sharing of information, including personal data, between public bodies. It will regulate the management of information by public bodies. Um, it will establish the, the, the base registries, the idea of base registries, and the collection of public information, and it will have a data governance board and so on. So the concerns that are there about privacy and so on and, and um, the personal information will be allayed, I think, by this, by this legislation and will be um, protected by, by this legislation. So um, 
so a lot of work has happened in terms of, of leadership in the public sector. And uh, also a lot has happened in terms of leadership of the CSO. And I'm only here just headlining the kind of um, things that have happened since 2015 in relation to the CSO. The most important, of course, is that the government recognised that the CSO needed more resources in order to give action to, to some of these issues um, and, and, and also to uh, give effect to some of the extra responsibilities that have been put on the CSO as a result of some changes in, in EU legislation as well back in 2015 and, and a peer review um, by, by the European Statistical System. But the important point is that there's more resources and what that has allowed to happen is the setting up of a really robust um, uh, a statistical system coordination unit within the, within the CSO which in turn can oversee all of the kind of reforms that we're talking about. So the CSSCU, which Paul heads up, um, is overseeing the growth and development of the Irish Statistical Service, the development of memoranda of understanding with various bodies, etc. cetera. The, the, effectively, the coordination of the entire statistical system, which includes standards and, and, and um, a whole lot, range of other activities, which I haven't got time to get into now. But the important point is that the CSO, for the first time ever, instead of just nodding and saying we need to do these things, has actually been empowered to give effect to the kinds of um, uh, changes and interventions that are needed to create um, a world-class Irish statistical system. And in terms of outputs, and some of you will, have, will be aware of the, the various Pathfinder projects that the, the unit has, has published already and more of them are in the pipeline. And these Pathfinder projects are hugely important in demonstrating the value of um, of administrative data, and many of the papers today will demonstrate the potential um, of administrative data and the practice of using administrative data and what it can really deliver for citizens and for uh, policymakers. And that is just hugely important and valuable. Um, in terms of challenges, then, so we've made some progress, as I've said. In terms of challenges, what are the key challenges we face? Well. You know, we must keep up the momentum, and, and it's easy to lose momentum. And so it's really important that the cross-departmental champions group, which, is, which are the, the, the people on the ground, if you like, who are, who are overseeing this, it's really important that they keep up the momentum and that they particularly um, advance the use of the air codes. For the board, and I think for everybody in this room probably, the slow adoption of the air codes is a really major concern. We spent so long working for this. We, you know, it was really hard to get it to happen. Ireland was the last country, as you know, in, in, the, in the developed world which, who adopted air codes. Um, and now the challenge really is to, is to, is to get widespread adoption. Unfortunately, widespread, ado unfortunately, adoption by public se sector bodies is not actually mandatory. They don't have to do it. And we feel that is a, a, a major obst obstacle to wider adoption. And those of you who have had the experience of going into a public sector body and offering your air code, as, as many of us had, and, and having it said, oh, no, you don't need it, it the frustration of that is, is really quite, quite uh, strong when you know the value of it and, and will be demonstrated really amply in later papers today in terms of, the, of, of um, doing, producing official statistics. And we would argue, and the board have argued very strongly, that we really need to have an action plan for a wider adoption of the air code. And I think when you hear some of the papers today, you'd be even more, uh, you'd be even more um, uh, convinced about that. I mentioned the data sharing and governance legislation going through the doll. Hopefully, will be through before before year's end, and that's really really important. Now, the privacy and, and, da and, and data protection and sustaining trust in official statistics is is is. You know, I've lumped them all together here, but actually they're in themselves. Each of those words are really, really, really um, challenging. And um, as regards data and privacy and, and data protection, it's really important, I think, to strike a balance, and those of us in official statistics can see this so much, between privacy on the one hand and public good on the other. And those of us who work in, that, in this area are, of course, always conscious that we are subject to much greater scrutiny and much greater legislative um, uh, oversight than the private companies who, who, who get your data and do with it what they will, and that even the citizen is much more um, willing, perhaps, to, to, to give um, their data to private companies than they are to necessarily um, official uh, bodies. So the, the, the issue around all of that and the need for citizen awareness and education around what, 
what official statistics actually deliver to a state is really important, particularly in an area of um, where we have um, issues about trust and that there's no longer a consensus in modern society about how we measure reality or indeed who actually um, are the most authoritative sources of reality. Thankfully, in this country, there is still a huge level of trust in official statistics. But internationally, as trust in public bodies and in the political system and in administrative systems gets undermined, this is an issue that is, is before us. And our board will, is, is, is constantly aware of that and constantly addressing, really, the kind of issues associated with that. Um, so the challenge for statistical authorities is to find ways to promote value, quality and authenticity of official statistics as a basis for evidence-based decision making. And as I say, so far so good in Ireland, but there's no point in being complacent. So in short, what will a functioning national data infrastructure, what will it w deliver to, to Ireland? Um, first of all, it will allow us, and you'll see this from the papers today, to just collect the data once and use it often so we don't have to constantly go out and ask people questions, or businesses questions, or ask them to fill in things online. It'll, it'll deliver us, and this is a, a subject very dear to my heart, much greater granularity in terms of being able to plan more efficiently and effectively at local level, and to, and to understand socioeconomic trends at much, um, at much um, uh, smaller geographies, if you like. Not to mention the possibility of actually visualizing much more effectively in relation to all of that. It will deliver consistency across the system. It will give us clarity on the use of the data that we collect. And ultimately, what we end up with having, if we get this right, is a much more efficient system and much better services for citizens. So that citizens don't have to repeatedly, and you all know this as citizens, give the same information over and over again at the hatch, at the desk, online, or wherever. So you have a really interesting morning in front of you. It's, there are some great papers, and hopefully this has provided a context from which with which you can hear what's being presented even more effectively. Thank you.